Hi, everybody. Today, I'm here to talk to you about the design implications of the real-time web. And needless to say, I've prepared some slides. It's a goat slide. It's a winning sports slide. <laughs> My name's Aaron. I started building websites when MySpace was cool, and my band was on tour and needed custom profiles, so we started selling them to sister bands to make money. I moved to Denver to start a company with three friends. After we grew it to north of a million in annual revenue, we sold it. I started freelancing out of our first galvanized location and realized I was doing more like business administrative stuff than I wanted to, so I started an apprenticeship program where I brought on junior developers to help work on client projects, and eventually ended up at a consultancy uh, building Ruby and JavaScript apps. I'm still heavily involved in open source. Who's familiar with Suzy, the uh, SaaS framework for grids? Cool. I work on that with Eric Suzanne. And um, now I'm at Galvanize, where we're an education company trying to disrupt the status quo. And we do that by, by integrating our curriculum with community and capital. So instead of a sports team, we have a venture team. Um, instead of just classrooms, we have co-working spaces where the classrooms often integrated with clients that they can do where they can do like real-world projects. It's super cool. I'm really here though to talk about the browser ecosystem and what it means to be building browser applications today. To the outside observer, it looks a little bit like this. Like Patrick doesn't know what's going on, and there's like cats everywhere. And to be fair, JavaScript got off to a bad start. <laughs> There's the definitive guide and, and what's known as the good parts, right? It, I think, really reflects the sentiment of the JavaScript community around 2008. I mean, the language was written in 10 days. You know, cut them some slack. And this, the reality is it's an evolving standard. ECMAScript 6 shipped. It's done. We can use it today. ECMAScript 7 is in the works, or ES Next, if you prefer, 2015, 2016. I, I prefer 6 and 7, personally. But we have a problem. That image doesn't load. Zero days since the last JavaScript framework. Has anybody seen that float around the internet before? Zero days. And a lot of people see that as a negative thing, and indeed, it causes a lot of the burnout we feel in the community. We're like always on top of things. We, we have to constantly learn something new, which is a challenge. Uh, but I think it's also a symptom of one of the major advantages to the JavaScript community, which is its diversity. Because the reality is, we didn't choose JavaScript. No one did. It had its problems from the beginning, but our users chose the browser. And as a consequence, we have Ruby developers just rushing to build you know, browser applications. We have iOS developers accustomed to this like client-server separation, really diving in and bringing their unique perspective to the ecosystem. So we have a lot of variety, and, and for the same reason that we value variety in the workforce, I, I value variety in our JavaScript ecosystem. And for some time, we've, we've been abiding by constraints of the past. If you haven't read the DAO of web design on a list apart, you really should. Uh, it, it's, it can be boiled down to this, this statement, new technology initially inherits constraints of its predecessor. And we've seen this come true time and time again through history when we had this new mechanism to communicate via print where we transcend space and time with our thoughts. And, then the radio was invented, and, and we can reach passive listeners or those who otherwise were preoccupied with their eyes or couldn't make use of their eyes. And then the TV was built on top of that. We, we could provide visual context for all of the things that were meant to be communicated. And with the internet, we, get, we were given the web, you know, these connected pages, and suddenly anyone could participate. But for some time, the radio uh, re really held back TV. TV, in fact, was called, it, it was called uh, Radio with Pictures for way too long because they were still just sitting down and having these conversations. It wasn't until, until later, in music videos even, that people realized they can do more than just like play on stage. 
They could like perform and have some like story to tell throughout. And now it's said that the web is being held back by the page metaphor. We're still thinking of things as pages on the web. Uh, and, and it's inherited very much of that from print. But it's holding us back. And that was never more apparent than when mobile hit the scene. The iPhone was invented. And very suddenly, the page metaphor just didn't resonate. It didn't make sense. We started to invent thick, thicker clients in the browser, um, or, or single page applications, if you were, and, and if you will. And a lot of um, people have kind of like realized the benefits of these. Some of them include you know, interactivity, where you can transition between routes, keeping uh, the perception of the time it takes to load data very low. Um, the distributed server load, you have just an API driving all of the data, and then clients doing most of the processing. And then finally, you have this like decoupled architecture where if you need to rebuild your, one of your clients, your, your iPhone app or your um, browser app, you don't have to completely rebuild your entire stack. You can leave the API, you know, agree on some contract between the two, and just build as many or as few clients as you need. And, and a lot of us are doing that today. Um, I, I want to talk, though, about where we're missing a couple of things and, and some stuff that I think we should start thinking about in single page applications, in, in the real time web. Um, we, we all are familiar with some of these concepts. Responsive, for instance, is pretty familiar. Uh, but I think apps of today are, are responsive, reactive, and real time. Or at the very least, that's what our users have come to expect. We're not yet taking complete advantage of this full medium, so I'm, I'm going to spend some time exploring that. Uh, this, this is the formula in responsive web that Ethan Marcotte invented. I think it was around like 2008, 2009. Uh, fluid layouts, flexible media, and media queries. But one thing that's often missed is context. There's a lot of context that we can gather from the user and lots of things we can glean from said context. Uh, specifically, we're, we're currently only gauging what we should do with our application based on resolution. But there's so many other things we can detect, including geo-coordinates, velocity, ambient lighting, and the network status. What does it mean for your app if your user is not at their home address and you just know that intuitively? What does it mean if they're like at an extremely high altitude with no network connection? I imagine a scenario where you're designing an application for a hospital and someone's going 60 miles an hour. They're not at their home address. It's very clear that they're on the go, probably driving. And if they're on your site, they don't want you know, your about page. They don't want to like, peruse your doctors. They want the contact information. Right? They want the address. There's a lot of information we can take from all of these. And currently, it's all possible in JavaScript. But there's a lot of talk in the CSS community about having access to this sensory data in CSS. Ambient light media queries is just around the corner. Apps of today are reactive. Uh, what I mean by that is that the templates automatically update when the underlying data changes for that said template. You can imagine a spreadsheet where A is the value of B plus C. And we're accustomed to that. If we change C, the value of A is updated. That's reactive. When you're typing in your, when you're going to tweet, you know there's some sort of limit, and it gives you a visual cue that you're reaching that limit slowly by counting down as the data backing that piece of the template is changed. Spell check, we all take for granted, but it like happens right under us as we type. Browsers just come with that. These are all reactive behaviors that we can start taking more and more advantage of. And with it, there comes this idea of reactive latency compensation. Uh, I, I, prefer, for, I prefer to call it optimistic UI. And the basic flow, if you're familiar with these flow charts, is, is that the user provides some input. Say they're adding new widgets to their, their application. And it immediately posts not over the network to the database, but instead to an in-memory database. The view is responsible for re-rendering then any time that in-memory database changes. So when it posts, the, the view is immediately updated. It's optimistic in that it assumes the user is allowed to add widgets. Once it's on the view, we send it over the network to the database and validate. 
and handle errors if necessary. It comes back and re-renders an error if it should, but otherwise, the user feels like things are just happening. This renders, that first step into the, from the memory database to rendering the view happens like that. And it makes our apps feel faster. There was a lot of talk about like, performance and single page apps and thick JavaScript clients in 2014, now in 2015. And people talk a lot about page load time. They talk about time to first paint, time to last paint, um, above the fold paint. And there's a lot of research that suggests from like Amazon, for instance, that their conversion rates increase by saving milliseconds. But I think they're looking at the wrong metrics. All of these are good, but I think the most important thing we can look at is time to operate. That is to say, how quickly can the user make a decision about the next action they'll perform based on their own goals? So we have to stop doing this. This must end. It's called a blocking interface. It doesn't give me any indication as to how long something will take. There's no progress shown. I can't make a decision about what will happen when this finally loads. An example of a non-blocking interface done really well by Facebook in recent months. This is their loading template. And immediately you can see generally where the main functionality of the app exists. For instance, on the sidebar, you might ignore it because the ads are going to populate or maybe secondary navigation. But the main purpose of this view is very apparent before anything even loads. So this allows users to immediately make a decision about what their possible next step might be according to their own goals. So we say that the time to operate is higher. And yeah, with the spinner, maybe time to paint's fast, but still, it's blocking. With reactivity and sensory data, we should start to consider the reactive offline state. Users want to know if their data is safe. They want to know if it's up to date. Who, who in the room uses Slack? Awesome, that's amazing. They're so great. They've done so many things well. And I tried this, disconnecting from the Wi-Fi while in the middle of a conversation. And it immediately lets you know. It detects that. It responds to it. It's going to try again. And it informs you of that. It's counting down. I know exactly when it's going to try again. This is very non-blocking, right? I, I feel relieved to know that it's trying something. The error goes away after its first attempt, but things are sort of muted, right? Something's not quite right yet. It's trying again. Sometime in the sequence counting down, I reactivate the network, connect again, and the message goes through. They were very aware of that scenario. They put a lot of time and thought into it, and they kept us informed through the whole process. Twitter, on the other hand, when you try to tweet, it says internal server error, <laughs> which can't be true. <laughs> right? They haven't thought really hard about that case. Um, I, I think we could be much more informed and feel much more relieved to know that they're handling it. They're on top of things. They're responding and reactive to the online state. So that's reactivity. We'll touch a little bit more of it later. But I want to talk now about real time and kind of what that means and what it implies. When we say real time, we, we mean that data stays on the wire. And after the initial page load, the only thing that changes is the part of the view that absolutely must and the only requests made back and forth to the server is the data backing each template. But why real time? Why is that so great? I would argue that it makes our productive tools more productive, our social more social, and our utilities more useful. On Lyft, in real time, I can see like, how far away my car is. I can see if they're going the wrong way. I can see how much longer it's going to take for them to pick me up. Um, on, on Slack, we have this very real-time experience. Without it, it'd be nothing. Who remembers then the day, the day, when you realized you no longer needed to refresh Gmail to get the latest, <laughs> right? That was bizarre. And, you know, I still refresh it, honestly, because I don't, I don't, the, the interface just, I don't trust. There's, there's something to it. Uh, but it's, it's coming in in real time, right? We're familiar with these concepts, and I think Google's been a real leader in that field. But there's unique challenges to working with real-time data, especially with list views. The canonical example is a chat app like Slack. So we know when you have a real-time app regarding chat that you append the messages. The thing no one usually thinks about right away when building something like this is that they also have to scroll the viewport. And you have to consider, when do you scroll the viewport? 
What if the user scrolled to the top reading old messages? Do you scroll it underneath their feet? So there's some like trickery that needs to happen to make sure that you're not interrupting the user and their goals. Twitter's done really well with this. Uh, they batch all of their updates. So if you've scrolled down to like 40 tweets ago, when new ones come in, it's not knocking you down and interrupting your reading. Instead, they're, they're letting you know there's new things there, but not interrupting the user. With real-time web, there's also this idea of progress retention. Eric Meyer wrote this really amazing article and has been talking a lot about designing for crisis. And one example could be a form where you're filling out a need for emergency supplies in a flood in Boulder or something. And like the network could be unstable. It could go out at any time. So it would be really nice if as you fill out the form, it's saving your current state. And people think that, but there are unique challenges to it. Google Drive does it really well. I typed in ASDF, ASDF on two cells here, and it lets me know in the top right, very subtly, that it's saving. It, not yet, but it's saving. And then it tells me it's saved. Great, my data is safe, my data is secure. It's, it's here and it's on the server. I feel like I could close this down, the network can go out, and my progress has been retained. I host people at, with Airbnb and they do this too. They, they save things as you change forms on the admin side. Um, but in this calendar view, if you scroll down, the saved status is out of view. And I didn't notice it. I was going to use it as a case study for like someone doing pr progressive retention but not doing it well. And I, I just realized that they, they indeed save. They, they let you know that they're saving, but for like a second. And if it's out of view, you feel really like frustrated and a little bit of anxiety. Is this like, are my users, my, my customers seeing the new data? If I close this down, is it still there? And it's not always clear. But that said, with great power comes great responsibility. And I think we should always consider the difference between the real-time web and, and the right-time web. This service aggregates all of the things you're subscribed to, stuff that normally comes in in real time and gives it to you once a day as opposed to cluttering your inbox throughout. And I think that's a really awesome service. They've recognized the, the burden that comes with some real-time content, and, and they've solved that problem. So I think apps of today need to be responsive, reactive, and, and real-time. Uh, we're, we're operating still under the constraints of our predecessor, this Web 2.0, where everything operates over HTTP with full page loads. So, that said, I'll demo how exactly you can get started prototyping these concepts very, very quickly with Meteor. Let's check it out. Meteor is a web framework. It's a full stack JavaScript from end to end. It's designed to build single page applications. And you can see using this how quickly you can at least start prototyping these ideas and experimenting with everything that I'm talking about today. And hopefully you can still hear me as I do this. Cool. The first thing to do is create a new app. I'm going to call it DVLPDNVR. You can't see my screen? Ah, there we go. Built-in retina display. All right, we're back. Thank you. All right, we're going to Meteor create developed Ember and CD into it. That gave me three files, a uh, CSS file, HTML file, and a JavaScript file. It comes with no real boilerplate, but it does come with an example application. And let's go ahead and launch it to mobile, because why not? I'm going to add the platform iOS. And it'll just take a second to start integrating Cordova into this default application. So we have that added, and I want to run it now. So it's building behind the scenes an iPhone application wrapped in Cordova. Um, is anybody familiar with Cordova and PhoneGap and kind of what that gives us? 
it lets us build HTML5 and JavaScript apps in, uh, in a wrapper that has native functionality. It interacts directly with the devices it deploys to. Um, and that's exactly what this is building right now. Starting it. Cool. So this is my application. We can see the same thing in the browser if we go to it. And it's pretty simple. You click a button and it increments the number of times the button's been clicked. Not too bad. Uh, but not very interesting. So let's play with it and deploy something for all of us to check out. First thing I'm going to do is crack open the app. and drop in a new template. The templating should look pretty familiar if you're used to Ember. Um, it has a name, hello, an input field, and a button. And it uses something that looks like handlebar syntax to iterate over the data backing this template, or the, or the data context, or the view model, depending on what framework you come from. And it spits it out here inside the body. So not too much happening yet. We do need to back it with some JavaScript superpowers. You'll notice two things here, which is pretty cool about Meteor. It has an is client property, returns a Boolean value to detect if this JavaScript's running on the client or the server, and it will conditionally run the JavaScript code we put here. Uh, same with is server. Any code outside of this runs on both, and that's going to give us the, for instance, in model database that I was talking about before with uh, reactive latency compensation or optimistic UI. So let's drop in some template code. First, we're going to create a new database. It's just a Mongo collection, calling it people. And then we're going to tag it with some uh, template helpers. By the way, this is like my cheat to live coding. You just like drop stuff in. It works. Pro tip. Um, here, we've just given the hello template some helpers, uh, specifically people. It's going to be backed by the data returned from the find method associated with the people collection. And we have an event listener on the button inside the template. This selector uh, is unique syntax. It's the event we're listening for and the selector scoped to the template we're currently attached to. And it's just a function that grabs the uh, input field and inserts the input's value jQuery comes with the framework. You could do this in vanilla JavaScript too. And then it resets the value to null, just an empty string. So let's check that out. I'm going to run this one in the browser just to demonstrate that that's a thing too. Localhost 3000 has our input field, and Aaron Gray. Cool. We see it updating the template automatically, but what we don't see is really how cool this is with the default real-time component. Also at localhost 3000, Aaron Gray and Matt. We can see it updating both in real-time. Um, it, it's so fast, you, you can't tell the latency compensation is, is actually happening here, but it is rendering my template before it ever persists to the database where we would perform some sort of validation, uh, which is really cool. But then I can deploy it like it's nothing. DVLP, DNVR, it'll only take a second. And once it's there, you should be able to go to dvlpdnvr.meteor.com. So go ahead and get out your phones. I don't know my username. It's building and building and building. It will be at dvlpdnvr, assuming that's not taken. It shouldn't be. Cool. 
It's minifying and concatenating all of the JavaScript code, all like 10 lines. It's uploading it currently to the server. Wait for it. I guess the network's pretty slow. Does anyone know any jokes? Safe for work? Safe for work jokes? <laughs> I need to learn some jokes. Here we go. Nice. <laughs> okay, we've deployed. Everybody's adding their name. This is great. And I'm not refreshing, right? This is just default to real time. Uh, so if you're ready to start experimenting with some of these concepts, if you're um, you know, in an engineer who knows like Mongo and WebSockets, you'll, you'll really love deep diving into some of these topics. And if you're a designer who just knows HTML and CSS, you, you can see the barrier to entry is pretty low uh, to, to start experimenting and, and prototyping these ideas today. Uh, thank you, everybody. That's all I've got.